Hello and welcome to today's video. So at this time we're going to be taking a look at my vintage pickups for the month of January 2022. So as you can see, there's a nice little selection of uh, vintage paperbacks here. Uh, we've got this one here, which is a brand new book, Confessions of a Book Collector, which I've finished now and it's absolutely fascinating. We've got the latest uh, issue from Justin Marriott, Battling Britain's issue two, and also we'll take a brief look at Men's Adventure Quarterly number four. Behind me here, I've got a whole box of uh, vintage penguins from Drew, the penguin chap. So we're going to unbox those and take a look. And then finally, I've got a viewer contribution, which we'll be having a look at now um, in a minute. And that's on the Albatross Vintage Continental Library. So there we are. So quite a bit to get through. So sit back, relax, and let's get to it. So we'll quickly uh, get this parcel unpacked. So if you've not used Drew, Drew specializes in vintage penguin books, right back to their earliest days. And uh, he's got a great website and I shall obviously link to that one down below. And uh, you can join his VIP penguin club. So you get first stab at new acquisitions as they get added to his stock. So let's dig these out. There's a couple of wedges in here. There we are. So we just get these out of their uh, plastic and then we'll have a really good look at them for the first time when we go through what we've got to get cleaned. But literally just as I started this, I <laughs> had a little parcel turn up. This is from the uh, from the States and um, it's for some Star Trek books, so next generation titles, which are going to be quite useful with my next Star Trek video. So let's get these bad boys out. Little note from Drew there. Drew says, Dear Jules, thank you very much for another order and freeing up some shelf space at the Penguin Chap HQ. Good to fill some gaps in your collection. Cheers, Drew. There we are. Oh, look, Penguin New Biology. Now, I've never showed them on the channel, but they're pretty dry. New Biology and Science News. And uh, I'm, I've got them complete now. And they're sort of like a magazine, in effect, that Penguin published on a monthly basis. And I suppose they're part of the Penguin story, so they should be covered. Lovely. There we are. So that's that little box unpacked. Then literally just while I was uh, unpacking those, I had another ring at the bell at the door and uh, had another little parcel come in. Now this is the first of two lots that I've got from the States of American um, Star Trek Next Generation books. So cool, they were well packed when they look at that. So some of these I've got, some of them I haven't, um, but I'm hoping that between the two lots plus uh, my patron, uh, Chris, Chris and Julia Edwards over in the States, and with all of his doubles, I should be fairly close to having enough to film all the early uh, books in the series. Some of them, of these are unread, some of them have been read, but on the whole, the price that I paid was uh, very, very good. So we'll have a look at those in a bit more detail as well. So blimey, that's everything unpacked. So let me clear the decks here a little bit and we'll get started through these. Well, I almost don't know where to start because I've got such a mishmash of stuff to have a look at today. So one thing that has come my way since last time, uh, well, since last month, was these Zephyr books. Now, these hardly ever turn up and they're very, very similar to the Albatross Library in that they were the Continental Book Company. And these were sold and printed for um, consumption in Europe, but not really in the UK. Um, so it says not to be introduced into the British Empire or the USA. So they've got these sort of plain white covers, but some of them had wrappers, which are quite uh, distinctive. Now, these came from, if you remember uh, last time, we had a big run of um, uh, vintage Albatross books, and I had these from um, a couple of quite old um, octogenarians, I call them, I say that. OAPs, they're both in their 80s, a bit like my parents, and uh, they're clearing their bookshelves slowly but surely. 
and I bought a few Albatross books off them. And they said, are you interested in any other vintage paperbacks? And I said, yeah, I mean, I don't mind if the price is right, picking up stuff like this, which isn't really my part of my main wheelhouse, but if it's cheap enough, I don't mind buying it. And I said, well, I'll buy it in bulk because that's how I like to buy my books. And I've got a few of these, don't get me wrong, but not many. Um, but seeing so many come through, they said, oh yeah, we've got probably another 10 of those or something. So you see, I'm just uh, putting some glue in this top of the spine here. They said, yeah, yeah, we got some of these. So, you know, they basically sent a few photos of what they got. And I said, yeah, that's the sort of stuff I'm after. Nice vintage paperbacks. Um, I sent them my penguin list. Sadly, they've got none that I'm after. And they said the bulk of what they've got is, is reprints and I only sort of collect firsts, in most cases for Penguin. So um, they're not going to be able to help me out there. But I have also given them my puffin list. I think they've got some puffins possibly up for grabs, which would be quite cool. There we are. That's that one. So that's the, the Land of Spices, K. O'Brien. So that just had a bit of a, a slightly coming away spine there. But apart from that, it's all right. So some Zephyrs are completely plain and some of them are in wrappers and we've got examples of both today. And I think as we work our way through, I'll put the different publishers in different piles and then we'll clean them all up. Now, I was particularly pleased to see this one in here because this is, I, I'm a big fan of C.S. Forrester, but mainly his Hornblower books. And this is the very first one, The Happy Return. So this is awesome. This was Zephyr number 29. Now I've got no idea when this was dated. Got a few pencil marks. 1945, this one. So that's pretty cool. Although they did go back even earlier than that, I believe. But yeah, if you've never read C.S. Forrester or the Hornblower series, um, I think you'll really enjoy them. Um, I seem to remember Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, being a big fan of these. And um, you do see bits of that coming through in the early episodes of Next Generation, uh, with uh, just the way that the ranks are dealt with and things like that. Um, but these Zephyr books, because they were predominantly printed for the continent, it's not like they turn up in the UK a lot. I mean, I've got maybe six in my collection, so not many. So this is going to vastly expand it. Not that I'm looking to collect them per se, but because these have come my way relatively cheaply, I'm going to Gonna be happy to have them, if you know what I mean. It's got this has got the flaps from the dust wrapper. Looking at Captain Horatio Hornblower, brilliant. I noticed the very first Zephyr is a farewell to arms by Hemingway. I wonder if that got published before the Penguin edition or not, I wonder. Anyway, cool, that's good to have. Here is a later Zephyr. Now this one is in a blue wrapper, Dennis Van Val Baker. So this is what they would have looked like outside their wrappers, underneath, so completely plain. So this one's a lot cleaner because the dust wrapper has done its job and it's basically looked after it. It stopped it getting dusty. Just a little 25p or 25 something in the corner. It may not have been pence. As I said, these were predominantly sold for English speaking people living on the continent. It's difficult to know with these which ones are first editions, which ones aren't. I'm not overly worried about having er early or reprint editions, a bit like the albatrosses really, because you just don't see them that often. Um, it's not like the Penguin books, which, you know, the first editions are perhaps a little bit harder to get hold of. But with these, almost like any edition is, is tough to find. So I'm not going to be overly um, picky about having a a first edition or not. This is an odd Hutchinson. So um, I bought a, I bought a load of Hutchinsons off them uh, last time round, which I've been through. I'm just I'm not even going to clean that one. I'm just going to put it with the other Hutchinsons and do all of those at the same time. 
here's a, another Zephyr. And this is a two-parter. So this is a bit like when Penguin did them in double volumes. Captain from Castile, Samuel Shellabarger, volumes one and volume two. Look at that. Numbers 153 and 154. And they're both in dust wrappers. So let's uh, do the first one. Look at this. Just looking inside there in the inside wrapper. Number 19 in the series was the Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett. I bet that's an expensive one. Apart from that, this is actually really, really nice condition. Very, very nice. Lovely. And I think because we're getting a bit of banding on the light, because uh, this is probably the last day I'll be filming outside the studio going forward, so it shouldn't actually be an issue. But because we are, I'm just gonna rearrange the lighting a little bit to hopefully dampen down the uh, the banding on the lights. So I'll be straight back. There we are, fingers crossed that makes things a little bit easier on the eye there. And there's volume two, very, very similar condition. Basically really, really nice. Very pleased with those. Don't know much about it, but evidently uh, it warranted a, a two volume two volume output on that one. See, so, yeah, that's pretty good. We've got a couple more here before we got some different stuff. So this is Cranford, Mrs. Gaskell. <laughs> Volume 66. This one's got a 30 pence inside. Now we get that out. There we are, no wrapper on that one. I'm sure at least one or two I've got upstairs in my collection, I've got a red wrapper on. This is the last one of this. Uh, Morning Becomes Electra, Eugene O'Neill. But it's nice to have a few representations for these early paperbacks. Even if they're not like my main, main focus. Lovely. Okay, so I think then, now is the time to do our first new book, which is this one, White Spines by Nicholas Royal. So I read this in a week and I, to be honest, I couldn't put it down. Every spare moment I had, I was uh, dipping in and out. And the chapters are really sort of small and, and they're really accessible. Um, so basically Nicholas Royal is, is a literary author, um, writes a lot of short stories, but he's also written some novels as well. I followed him for years on Instagram um, because he collects Picador white spines. They are, you see the, the bit of the logo there. So Picador were an imprint that uh, Pan introduced in 1972 and it was their literary imprint, um, but published by Pan. There he is on the back there. You can just see his, uh, his um, Picador collection behind him. And basically it's, he collects up to about the year, I think 2000 or so, um, from 1972 to 2000, uh, the, the classic Picador white spine imprints. He does collect other stuff as well, such as the later King Penguins, the literary King Penguins, the Virago modern classics, which are lovely with those green spines. And he also is a fan of the Agatha Christie Tom Adams covers. So we have a lot in common. Um, what makes this book fun is he recounts you know, his trips to uh, author's houses, he gets gifted some. Um, he makes a note of what we're bound to see in this, what he calls inclusion. So that would be when you, you're going through a book and you come across like a bus ticket or which is what I tend to find or uh, various bookmarks or plane tickets, this sort of thing. Um, and the more interesting they are, the, the better they are. And he will even try and research a previous owner's name to see if they're around still or if, if he could tie that particular book or copy to a person. I mean, it's happened to me before, you know, I've had books which I've picked up just because I like the book. And then um, I've gone home and found that they're signed or they've been dedicated to someone or they've got an interesting uh, little thing inside, particularly some of my 30s and 40s ones are fantastic. I, I love books with really sort of poignant messages. Um, I suppose my favorite of all, I mean, it's, it's quite solemn really, is um, it was um, the chap who wrote Dr. Strangelove. Now, what was his name again? Um, so I was able to conveniently ask 
Mr. Google, and they came back and reminded me that it was Peter George. So I picked up a, a copy of Peter George's Doctor Strange Love at a, a, a boot sale, jumble sale, and it was the second movie tie-in edition. And I have uh, shown this on the channel, so I'll try and remember to put a link to it down below when I edit this. And um, it was to Taff with best wishes from the author, Peter George, and it was just on the inside front cover. And it was dated like July 1966, literally less than three weeks later, the guy blew his brains out. He shot himself because he was like paranoid about um, the end of the world, nuclear war. How And that was really poignant, that one. Um, but um, yeah, so anyway, back to this. Um, so Nicholas does include interesting like signatures and where they've come from. I think it's, it's great. He, he goes around all the, like, the charity shops and, and the regular haunts of book collectors and anyone watching this channel has stepped where he has stepped before. I'm absolutely certain of it. And you'll find an awful lot in common. Um, for me, um, I'm not going to rush out and start collecting picadors, but I think I wouldn't mind the first couple of years worth just to go on the tail end of my vintage pan collection. Um, but it's just a really great, enjoyable read. And um, thankfully, um, as you know, I do the occasional series of viewers collection videos. Uh, Nicholas has agreed to share his collection of picadors and other bits and pieces from his collection in the next viewers collection video, which I'm hoping to put out in the next few weeks. So look out for that one. But in the meantime, do grab yourself a copy of White Spines uh, from your local bookshop or buy it online, which is what I did. And uh, I think you'll be absolutely delighted with it because I certainly was. Um, okay, now on to some more from that collection I got. Now this is another, I couldn't quite get this. This is the Olympia Press Traveler's Companion series, but it says that they're published by Foursquare. And they even have the same Foursquare logo, which became New English Library. So these are a real oddity to me, and I've never, ever come across them before. So all I can really think of is that they're published late 60s, which is when New English Library came about, and, the, and Foursquare was coming to an end. Um, and possibly just distributed in the, on the continent rather than in the UK. So here we are, published by the New English Library, first published by the Olympia Press in 1966, by the New English Library Limited in May 1966. So here we are. So it's clearly very, very early New English Library. But who'd have thought it? Because these things just don't turn up. And I can only... So when you think of the New English Library, you think of some of their like sort of garish 70s titles, you know, like the Edge books or Skins or Punks or Bikers and things like that. This is very much more... Um, sort of literary titles, so I don't know where these have, these were sold, but it makes me think, along with these other collections and a lot of the books that we, uh, this particular collection contained, um, these were books that were for English-speaking people um, who were living outside of the UK. And uh, we got a few of these, and that's what these, uh, the, the, the couple that I bought these books off, that's what they did for a lot of their uh, lifetimes. I believe they were teachers. Um, this one's a little bit the worse for wear. It's got some loose binding here, so. Got 30p, but it's in pen. Yeah, 1967. So 1967, I believe, is when New English Library actually started. Because um, the earliest book I've got in my library, which is a 1967 one, is... Um, that Girl on a Motorcycle, which is quite a nice, that's like the first of their sort of slightly, not risque, but slightly edgy books from that period, you know? So just a few turned over corners here to sort out. But yeah, we've got a couple more of these, they're really unusual. Really, they're numbered as well. I don't know. See that? See that number there? That's 1641. That, I think, is like a four-square strict New English Library number. And this is like a sub-series part of it. I'm absolutely certain of this now. And very, very unusual. Very unusual indeed. This has got an interesting bookshop stamp in which I don't mind. The Toy Bookshop in Gillingate, Young Adam, 
furniture there. It looks, I don't know. Couldn't quite make it out. Now this one is much wider. It's much, much wider. Look at it compared to a normal paperback. It's, it's even wider than a B format and it's slightly taller. So what was, oops, what was the reasoning behind that? To have this real oddity, you know? It's only got the four square thing. Oh, well, here we are. Look, it's because it's illustrated. And it is um, the, an anthology of tales, poems, scientific documents and treats, which appeared in the short-lived and much-lamented Olympia magazine. Well, this is a bit of a miscellany, isn't it? Wow. That is really unusual, isn't it? Oh, and look at this. Number 114 in the Continental Library. Look, Junkie, William Burroughs. I wonder if that's in here, although I think I would have um, seen it and already jumped a million miles if I'd come across a copy of Junkie. <laughs> so I've still got the top edges of those to run through. Uh, oh, this was really good. So this is uh, paperbacks in print. So I wonder if any of my viewers have come across this before. So this is, uh, there we are. This is published by Whitakers. And um, this is basically, they did one of these a year. Um, and this is every paperback that was in print in the UK, um, done by classification by author. And as you'll see, the publishers themselves um, put in sort of adverts inside. So if you're a collector, that's the author in it. It's absolutely fascinating to see what the different publishers were. Um, there we are, Black Cat Books, Pan there. What the different publishers were advertising at that time. It's brilliant. And you'll see publishers which weren't actually, which aren't that well known like that, of Koala Books and Blimey. Fontana Library. They're brilliant, aren't they? So there's quite a few of these to collect. And they're really good reference material, as you can imagine. And all the main publishers had a page or two in here, as you would imagine. Mills and Boons. <laughs> Corgi, Bantam, Penguin Classics. It's good, isn't it? Faber. Yeah, really nice from a period when I like to collect these. This is from my period, really. So um, very, very nice to, to see these. They don't turn up that often, um, but I just thought that's a real curiosity. The one I thought you might like to see. Uh, this is the latest fanzine from uh, Justin Marriott, uh, Battling Britons. This is issue two. The first one was absolutely fantastic. I loved it. Um, so I haven't read this one yet, so I can't pass judgment, but you just know it's going to be brilliant packed with uh, pocket-sized reviews and looks at uh, different uh, war-related British publications. Some of the digests are covered as well as the comics. Um, last issue had some American stuff, so there's probably some of that in here as well, some US comics. Absolutely fantastic. It's not something I'm passionate about, but um, I do uh, enjoy what I've read of the genre, you know? Right, well, Conveniently, right here is a big pile of penguin books. This is the stuff that we got from Drew, the penguin chap. So I doubt they're going to need that much in the way of cleaning, but it's nice to have a look through and see what we've got. Now, this was uh, the most expensive one I got off him. I think I got it for £25, which I thought was a fair price for this particular one. I have seen Egyptian editions go for less. Um, I've seen some go for more, but... Um, this was nice because it was a special and um, I particularly like the specials and I pretty much got all the classic ones. It's just a few at the very tail end of the 60s and the RSBM ones, which I'm missing. So this is an Egyptian one. So it's got PT6 there, sale price in Egypt and uh, all the adverts are um, Egypt related. And these came out during the war and they are, as you would imagine, very, very scarce in the UK since they were only for sale in Egypt and Palestine. There's Drew's uh, bookmark. There we are. So if, as I said, check out the Penguin Chap online. Uh, 
And there we are, so it says published by W. Jeffrey Eady, representative in Egypt, in Cairo. And there we are. This edition is made available in the Middle East through the cooperation of NAFI. There we are. Very, very rare, that. Very rare indeed. Um, not many copies of these have survived, as you might imagine. There's quite a few um, uh, Egyptian editions, and there also is Palestinian editions, which are even rarer, um, of which I've got none. But yeah, I've got a couple of Egyptians. So um, once again, um, and you've uh, off um, Drew, he's found some uh, cheap and cheerful sort of, not really collectible, but nice nice 60s editions, um, which were filling a few holes in, in my my collection, which are really good. So i um, very pleased to get these. I mean, that's one of the great things about Drew's site. Um, he's full, it's full of, of great bargains to be had. So don't feel, you know, even though it's a specialist collector's website that you need big pockets to go in because you don't. Most of these are a couple of pound a piece, which is not bad at all. And um, he's always picking up new collections and stuff. So he'll happily take a wants list It's a little very faint 1966 date inside. Facial justice. But yeah, we've got books from all over the, the period, right, well, right up into the 90s at least this time. So from the 30s to the 90s in this particular month. I'm surprised I didn't have this one, but I definitely haven't. Another 60s one. And the classic, this is the sort of style of artwork. This one's a Quentin Blake, who I generally I like, but that's certainly not one of his better ones. Um, some of the, the covers around this period, some of them were absolutely great. Others are really sort of suspect and not, not a favorite of mine. You know, this is 1964, this one. They are hit and miss, shall we say. That's a bit better, that's a bit more to look at. Nicholas Bentley actually drew that as well. How can you bear to be human? Cartoonist there. Nice fun book. Slowly but surely filling in my uh, my penguins from one thousand to three thousand. Something that probably will never, ever be attained completely, but it's nice to get some in between here. So um, this is probably the last day I'll be filming in the house because as I film this today, the studio is, is all built. And um, it's just, um, I have a, a table basically to build so I could have got something to film on um, and uh, move all my stuff up and, and have a little experiment and see. It's going to take, I think, a few goes to get really, um, to get all the lighting and stuff perfectly. But one of the things, you know, at the start of this video, we had the, the flashing sort of light, the strobing effect. It's because uh, to the left and right of me, I've got proper spotlights, which I'm going to move into the... Uh, into the studio, but up above me is um, LED lighting, and that doesn't work very well when you're recording. It creates this sort of strobing effect, which is uh, not ideal. So that's what I'm trying to uh, avoid. And the, the lights that we've got in the studio are definitely the sort which do not strobe. So I think as long as I've got the spotlights not too close, we should be absolutely good to go. So in a lot of cases, the studio has been built with the thanks to my uh, 
Patreon and channel members. And I do thank them every single video for uh, helping out. Their contributions do make a huge, huge difference. Um, you know, revenue from YouTube is very fluctual and um, it, it does vary throughout the year. So leading up to Christmas, there's a lot of brands that are advertising. So um, the revenue that you get from your videos goes up. Whereas in January, it, it literally plummets and every YouTuber I know says the same. And it was the same last year, in actual fact. So it moves in, in waves and peaks and troughs, but I'm not here for the money but the money that has come in has been very useful to um to to build the uh the studio so i'm gonna have a be able to do a lot more um videos and also i'm hoping to do live streaming that's going to be a real plus side going forward is i'm looking to do some live streaming literally i'm hoping within the next um week or so so as the studio is up and running, I think it's going to be good. I've got good phone signal out there. I can connect to the internet, but I could also stream over 4G. So I don't know if there's anything going to stop me doing it up there. Except just having the time to do it. So what I thought I'd do when I do do some live streaming, I'm going to make them themed. So I'll do a live stream on, uh, I don't know, for my Star Wars collectors for example i'll do a live stream on vintage book collecting i think that would be fun and uh, i'll maybe do a live stream on old doctor who you know we talk about different subjects and sort of try and theme it you know i think that would be the way to go there we are so they're all good to go so I just pop these over here because they're all going to still going to need a, a dusting off, which is something that's going to I shall do once we've been through everything. Okay, next thing we got to look at is um, the latest issue of the Men's Adventure Quarterly. Now I'm going to do a dedicated uh, review of this. It might even be on the channel by the time you watch this. If not, it'll be due uh, within just a few days. So this is issue four. Um, absolutely fantastic magazine here. I've got the uh, the first three here. So they're uh, edited by Bob Dice and Bill Cunningham. And they're great, great stuff. So I'll just give you a, an idea. These are classic um, stories reprinted from the Men's Adventure magazines. And um, that gives you a little taste of what's to come. Uh, unfortunately, um, the content is a little adult for this channel. So, uh, in fact, for YouTube in general. So I'm going to have to be a little bit more selective about what I actually cover with this one. So it's going to make filming it, at least properly, a bit of a challenge. But we shall see. Um, what's this then? So this was from yeah, Paul Barnes. So Paul sent me, completely out of the blue. Um, Paul's been watching the channel. He really loves the videos. And um, he sent me this, which was the... Um, the bibliography for albatross books because i didn't actually have a list of these and um lo and behold uh, richard williams who used to uh, produce these back in the day uh, well this one came out this second edition came out january 2006 and it says this second edition new impression july 2015 so maybe they're still being published but this is basically it's just like a little photocopied list it's every single albatross book that ever got published and uh Really, really fascinating. Not much in the way of a history of them, but there is a, a sort of a smallish history of the publisher. Just a couple of pages here, but really, really great. So thank you very, very much for that, uh, Paul. And a bit like Drew, he sent a picture of, well, the master, Ian Fleming. So yeah, thank you very much, Paul. That was really um, gratefully received. And uh, I do love stuff like that. So if you've got stuff like that lying around, those like, bibliographies and checklists I think are absolutely uh, priceless. Next, the most expensive book that I bought in January. I treated myself to this one. Um, I now only need six books to complete the first 1,000 penguins in first printing. And um, it was seven until one of these came along. Um, this is from a friend of mine called uh, Joe Pearson. He's also a publisher, but uh, Joe and I have known each other for I don't know, 25 or so years now. Um, always a, a font of knowledge and his 
penguin collection is just uh, superb. And um, this is a double that he came across recently and it was one that I needed, so uh, I was more than happy to grab it. So just six left to complete my collection of the first thousand in first edition, which I would very, very much like to do. Um, I'm just gonna leave that one in its bag. Right, we've got a few more Zephyr books here now, so just a handful. So this one's a, a little bit worse for wear because look at the state of the uh, dust wrapper there. But I want to keep it because even though it's in a state, it is on the correct book. How much is that pencil? Yeah, it is. This pencil is coming off uh, pretty easily as well, so that's good news. Excellent stuff. Memoirs of Heckant County, Edmund Wilson. I don't know any, I don't think I've ever heard of that one. It really is falling to bits, but I'm not gonna try and <laughs> repair the wrapper at all because it will just make it worse. But at least it's sort of there. Now, back in the day, I would just pull off wrappers like that and have the book on the shelf without its wrapper because it would look better. So I may, when I get this up into my collection, I'll take that wrapper off and I'll put it in with my, I've got a, a box of um, paperback dust wrappers that are laid out flat so that they don't get damaged. And then I'll put it with that one. And then if I ever come to sell my Zephyr books again, I can marry it up with it. Um, Eduro Welty, A Curtain of Green. Hmm, another one I don't think I've ever heard of. It's a slightly better wrapper, but still got some vintage repair to it. And you find that these books that were published on the continent are so much better quality than the British ones, because even after the war had finished, Britain itself was still suffering with paper rationing. So publishers, you know, still had to print fairly sparingly. It wasn't like as soon as the war was over, they could just go to town. It, it really just wasn't like that. It's hard to believe when, uh, like I was reading Nicholas Rawls' book earlier, um, and that's published by Salt Publishing. And um, it's, it's really well produced, the book, the font, everything about it is really, really nice. It's a real book lover's book, that. And it's nice to see that that's still being sort of published. Now, this one's got a fiddly bit of pencil on the inside cover. So I just use another book underneath, just so that I've got something to push on to try and rub that out. And it actually is coming out really easily. So that's good news. And that's a good little tip that I just put another book of a similar size underneath. And then you can apply a bit of pressure confidently without knowing knowing you're not going to damage the book any further. There we are, like so. Amazing to get so many of these in one hit. Really, really unusual. But it was like getting all those albatrosses the other month. I couldn't believe that. And I believe I've got a few more here. And the same couple have come up with another load of books, which I've got in the way, but they're going to be in my February pickups video. So, uh, We'll have to look at them next month, but there's more of this really vintage stuff. As it is, I'm cleaning these as I go along, but I've got all the Hutchinson's still too clean. I've just not gone around to it. Um, I might have to do those and put them out on my other channel, which if you've not uh, gone over and had a look yet, I do have a dedicated book cleaning channel called Unintentional ASMR, Book Cleaning and Repair, which is um, just got book cleaning related videos on. Now uh, that's, is it? pen yes sadly that's that 10 p is in ink so i cannot get rid of it but that's okay it's also got a tiny little bit coming away at the top of the spine so i'm going to pop a little bit of glue on it just to uh Seal that bit in there. I'm 
just want to sort of smear it along the top really. Tiny bit more. Yeah, so amazingly, I've got about another 50 on the way from this couple of more of these sorts of books that they found. So, uh, you know, incredible, really. Uh, you would have thought they would have had them all, but you said they're all sort of dotted all over the house. So, uh, as I said, I think they're downsizing. And uh, the time has come to get rid of them. So I said, well, they'll be going to a good home. <laughs> there we are. That's all right, isn't it? Cool. Look at that big pile of them over there. I think this is the last one. Saratoga Trunk. Edna Ferber. Yeah, so now that I've finished uh, Nicholas Rawls' book, I'm, I'm right at a bit of a loose end. I don't know what to start next. Um, there was a few that he recommended that sounded great, you know, so... Oh, what's this? this is a bit... Somebody, Leicester Square, January the 30th, 1946. Kess or Keys? Hmm. It's a bit something written in bright pink like that, isn't it? Come on. Obviously not a book dealer, because they would have written in a light pencil. Anyway, we'll leave that in there. I think that was the last Zephyr book. Now what have we got? An albatross. Hey, hey it's a nice one as well. Maggio Marsh, dyed in the wool. Nice condition with this. Don't often get many crime ones. This is the post-war period when they got revived. But yeah, the crime ones are quite scarce, so I'm very pleased to get that. Now we've got a few guild books today. This is a scarcer one because this is a services edition. So there's a few guild books. So the, most services editions from guild are this wider sort of digest format, you see like that? Whereas this one is slimmer. And these ones here actually were much, much harder to get hold of. Um, and I think this is the only one I've got in this this um, size. Most of them are the wider ones, which I think are actually a lot easier to get hold of, and I believe were even sold in, in places like WH Smith. That one's all right. So, but these ones, yeah, look. The surplus government stock of this edition has been purchased by WH Smith for sale at a shilling. So Smith bought all of these, and... Um, that's what they did, but you see on the back they look produced for the Central Services Book Depot for circulation to the fighting forces of the Allied Nations. So even though these were printed as war had come to an end, um, this one's 1944, so near an end. Um, they were on sale in the UK. They were sent to overseas as well, and probably throughout Europe and even further away. But because they were sold in the UK, copies are around. So this one never saw action, as it were, because it's got that sticker on saying it was sold through WH Smith. So this one never went overseas at all. Um, this one here probably would have been the same, because you can see look, that stick, same sticker would have been on there. And I've got a few books like that, which have got that sticker on. So sadly, although it's nice to have it as a service edition, it wasn't actually used by the services. Here's a... Forrester again, second one today. Another one with the, the label on. But that doesn't stop them being absolutely fascinating. And I do really, really like them. So uh, I'm very pleased to have them. Uh, these Guild ones were like uh, not especially well made compared to some, you know, some publishers, but still very, very nice. and. I've seen these go, you know, some, some of these have gone for like five to ten pound each. So don't overlook them if you do come across them, because I think they're worth picking up, you know. Uh, here's uh, another nice one here, Man Trap. This is another crime one. Yeah, nice, nice condition, that one as well. It says VC 50p in the inside. 
that's really nice because it's it's a really sort of that's got legs in the corner there. A really nice high grade one. And that's not something you can say about a lot of books from this period, particularly services editions. Look at that, it's a really nice one. I know it never went overseas. This is one of those Smiths ones again, but even so, that's lovely. I really, really like that one. A little bit of fading on the spine, but we're not gonna hold it against it. This is nice. Wind, sand and stars, and home to Saint Exuberat. Exuberat. 20p on the front. Let's get that off first of all. Now these, um, you see that it like staining, it's like someone spilt their gravy on it. Um, that's the staples coming through. Now the staples have rusted and they're coming through. This, this is compared to the last one, this is in much, much worse condition. But you've got to uh, admire these as just relics from a time when, you know, these sorts of books were completely disposable. They were designed to be read, possibly passed around a couple more times. People weren't saving them or anything like that. Although obviously some people did. It's just got a few torn, torn um, folded over uh, corners there. But this was, I see special number 10. So there is a great website which looks at these early British publications, the pre-war and immediately post-war ones. It's called, what's it called? Um, Paperback Revolution is what you need to look it up. And once again, if I remember, I'll pop a link to that website in my description down below. Um, and I personally have learned an awful lot from the, the chap behind it. He's put up lists of some of these, some of the stuff he's after, and also, um, you know, what's sort of known to exist. Um, I've been through all my, not these, but I've been through all my uh, collection, and I haven't got anything that he's not got, um, at least listed as knowing to exist, even if he doesn't have it personally. So I'm particularly pleased to get this. Look, it's uh, Ernest Hemingway. So that's really, really nice. S92. I really like Hemingway. So that's that's superb to get that one. Brother Kane, Paul Capon. I see this one, for example, hasn't got the Smith sticker on anywhere. So we would assume that that one actually did did go to the intended source. And in actual fact, now I've looked at it again, I see the there needs to be a little bit of glue just at the top there to stop that bit of getting any worse. I'm just going to slide a little bit of glue in here, particularly since it's Hemingway. He deserves the treatment. There we are. Just keeps the title as intact as possible. <laughs> Brother Kane, hmm. a bit more worn that one. See, that's 1946, that's a later one. But they published these 46 up to about 47, I think, you know, immediately post-war. Oh, look, another one. Look at that, see as far as another one. I might even have that one, Brown on Resolution. Sadly, not a Hornblower related title, one of his other ones. I think it's a crime one, but it's still excellent to have. Special number 50. Edition, fresh printed in this edition, 1943. Once again, look at that down there. You just see the, the rusty staples coming through about how it's, that's where it was bound. Right, a complete change of pace now. So um, one of the series that I've been absolutely loving to film um, is my classic Star Trek books. And I've been covering the books chronologically pretty much as they've been coming out. So my next Star Trek video 
also includes the very first couple of Star Trek Next Generation books. So because those are going to be the next ones, I've, I've completed all the Star Trek books, uh, classic Star Trek, but there's lots and lots of Next Generation that I'm missing. In fact, I only had a handful. Um, and um, me being me, um, I really don't like the British editions, which were published by Titan for the first couple of years or so. I want American firsts. So thankfully, these books are cheap and cheerful and plentiful uh, in America. And using eBay's global shipping program, you can actually get these books quickly without any customs duty and fairly economically. So even though I've got this big pile of books here, says one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen next generation books, these have probably only cost me about one pound fifty a book, which I don't mind paying that for these, because in a lot of cases, not all of them, but most of these, probably 80% of these are actually unread copies. Now one of my patrons over in the States, Chris, who's my sort of go-to Star Trek guy. He's got um, a complete run of all these books, pretty much. And um, Chris has also helped me out with spares and that. And he gave me the little tip that, like the classic Star Trek books, if the logo is raised, so you see the logo on this, this is like a raised logo, then that means the book is, generally speaking, a first edition. So you have a look inside there, and it says first printing, May 1990, and it's got the numbering from 10 all the way down to 1. So that is a first edition from May 1990. And like the Trek books, this is numbered number 11 there. All right. So that's that's the basis behind these. So my suspicion was that these were all original owner collections. And all these are going to need in a minute is that once we brush the tops, because I noticed some of them have got a little bit of dust on, is a really good polish. These are going to come up spanking, absolutely spanking. So I am personally over the moon with these. Now I've got a second load due um, and the second lot will be, um, I said first as well, the second lot will be shown in my February pickups video. This is a raised one again. So this is looking good for a first edition. Yeah. Amazing to think this is over 30 years old now. I mean, it's astonishing, isn't it? I see Mr. Data, you know, Brent Spiner. I think he's in, he's in his late 60s. I think this is the very first one, number one. It wasn't the first book published. That was the pilot encounter at Farpoint. But this is, yeah, that is the first print of number one. So, uh, you know, I think I've done very well here. So apart from that, which is going to come right off when I polish it, and I'll put my brush on that. So it's going to, you know, it's going to lighten it up. But basically, these are almost as good as I could have hoped for, to be honest. Number three here, this one's been red, so it's got a few spine creases. So it may be that I do end up upgrading a few, but because I bought a few job lots, I think, and plus hopefully Chris will have a few of these in his collection. I'll be able to upgrade them without too much uh, problem. Number two here. Yeah, it's got the, I'm just feeling the raised series logo, which indicates the first printings. And every single one of these has been a first print. So I think I've done very, very well already. Back in the day, when I had my shop, I sold these books brand new as they were getting published and absolutely loved them then. Um, but I never really collected them because there was just so many to get through. You could just couldn't collect at all, could you? Ah, here is the very, very first one. The next, this was Encounter at Far Point, which was the pilot for the Star Trek Next Generation series. That's the first there from October 87. Obviously introduced Q, didn't it? Yeah, that's the first. Every single one of these has been a first edition. They're just a little bit dusty, which is, I'm going to be able to sort that out. This dust and mold, well, not mold, but dust and, and just storage wear. These books are going to come up an absolute treat in a minute when they get the polish polish on them. Yeah, first from 89. Oh, I'm so pleased with these. Number eight. Look at this, look, they've just been, they've just been in storage. There we are, look at that. These are just going to come up beautiful. There we are. 
And the second lot I've got coming pretty much start where these numbers end. It's, yeah, it's a completely different person. So um, it's just going to be a few in the 20s I think I'm going to be missing. Look at that. Every, every last one of them was a first edition. I, I literally can't believe how lucky I've got with those. Um, and although a couple of them have been read, I think they're going to come up really, really well once they've been uh, cleaned up. So we're sticking them all up there because we're going to have to have a good old clean brushing and polishing session in a while since then out of the way right we've still got um two stacks of vintage paperbacks to look at so let's without further ado just keep cracking on here so we got the jared's jackdaw library now these were one of the offshoots of hutchinson's i believe um and um they're quite it's fragile. This has got the bits of the dust wrapper attached to it. <laughs> Not much. Yeah, I believe these were one of the little offshoots from Hutchinson. As far as I know, Jackdaw. I wouldn't say I was a massive fan of these, but at the same time, it's nice to have them. So that needs a little bit of glue in there. So I'm going to do that. On the whole, I don't think these are going to need much uh, in the way of um, repairing, just little bits and pieces, really. Um, but I'm just going to pop a little bit of glue in there just to um, put the spine on a little bit cleaner. Yeah, so I'm over the moon that the uh, studio is virtually there. Unfortunately, I was hoping that this was going to be the, one of the first videos I filmed in it, but um, just because of time constraints, um, I needed to get like today's filming out the way, um, and then I'm going to then I'm going to finish off building the studio, and I'm going to move all my uh, lighting and stuff to it, and then I'm going to need a little probably an, I'm going to need an afternoon to tr to test the lighting out and then the sound and stuff like this, the microphones. Um, and then I can just work on sort of the backdrop as we go along. But do look for a dedicated sort of, I built a studio video on the channel because it's gonna be brilliant. Um, I certainly, I recorded the entire process. Um, so you'll definitely be able to get to see how it all came together. Um, and uh, now that it's there, I'm really, really pleased uh, with the way it's come about. And I think it's going to make things a lot easier filming in future, you know, because it means I won't need to wait. Like today, when, you know, my boy's at school and the wife's at, actually at work today. Um, yeah, she's working at work rather than at home. So uh, it's a nice quiet house to film in, but it's not always like that. So that's the real advantage. So this one here, look, it's a Jackdaw crime book. So their Jackdaw, I mean, they didn't last very long, but their crime books were these sort of mustard orangey covers, weren't they? Look at that, the Jackdaw crime series. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Double Spy, number 12. Yeah, there's Hutchinson. So that, yeah, these jackdaws were one of the little imprints from Hutchinson who tried all sorts, didn't they? I think um, I think one of their interesting ones is Toucan. I'm not sure if they were Hutchinson related or not, but they're very similar to these jackdaw ones. And I quite like them. And they were uh, printed in Plymouth, which is where I'm from. But um, the couple that I've been buying these really old paperbacks off haven't got any Toucan books, unfortunately. Yeah, so this is a completely separate series. So that's that crime series is completely separate to the normal Jackdaw library. So that's interesting. So I'll remember that when I get to shelve these. But I think because I've got so many Hutchinsons to do, um, what I'm going to do is a dedicated, I'm going to pull the Hutchinsons that I've got in my main collection out and I'll do a dedicated video just on them because I think they're going to be quite interesting to do. Uh, now this one, 
yeah, that's got a little bit, need a little bit of re-gluing. Some of my very early Hutchinsons, I think, are Dennis Wheatley books, you know. Old him of the uh, 70s, got into the occult, didn't he? And he did some he did some quite creepy books back in the day, in the 50s and 60s, uh, Haunting a Toby Jug, and um, The Satanist was another one. I remember loving them as a kid. And uh, I did the hammer adaption of uh, The Devil, Devil Rides Out. There we are, so that's just repaired that bit of spine. But as you can see on these, the tops of these, it's so, so dirty. They're gonna really, really need um, a good brushing off. Jack door number six. So my suspicion is all of these came in dust wrappers. even if they're not in them today. And I think this is one of those series that perhaps once I cleaned them up, they would have been, they would be nice to just bag up. I think they'd be easier to handle um, and they would get sort of less sort of damaged and wear. They don't, these ones, and I find this with all the Hutchinson ones, they don't feel great in the hand because I think they're mass produced and they're not, they're just not treated, or they just weren't printed with the same sort of level of care that say the 40s Collins Crime Club books were, which are a step up from this, and also the Penguins from this period. Um, these are just a bit too cheap and they just don't feel that nice in the hand compared to the other publishers, you know? So that's the only reason I would be tempted, once these have been cleaned, um, to pop them into comic bags, or paperback bags rather, just to keep them nice and vibrant and, and clean really, um, because there ain't no way I'm going to sit through and read a book like that. It just doesn't feel very nice in the hand. Although actually the print is actually pretty nice and clear for me. Um, that's not too bad, but even so, Right, oh, I've got a few more while we're here. Um, oh, look, another crime one. The Borderline. Jackdaw Crime number 14. Got an advert on the back. Oh, look, there's a little list of them, the first 16 crime ones. As I said, if you go to Paperback Revolution, he has got lists of all these series, pretty much. So you can, you know, like checklists and that. I think, you know, um, most of them are up there on there, uh, on his website. This is quite fragile, this one, but it's a crimey, so it will be highly collectible just because of the subject matter. Mm. It looks to me like the spine has actually already been re-glued. Someone's actually done that one before it's got to me, although I could do the bottom bit there, but the top bit has already been done by someone. But that's okay. I am going to re-glue that bit at the bottom though, because that, I think, does warrant it. So after the studio is done, I then have a new project, which I'm gonna, which I'm sort of thinking about at the moment. And um, I have spoken to a few sort of noted collectors and everyone so far has been super keen on this. So whilst we're cleaning these last few books, I'll go into it. So if you've managed to stay this far into the video, which is almost an hour long already, an hour, and don't forget we've got the, the cleaning and polishing to do yet. Um, oh, back onto, oh no, we're, before we do that, we'll just do these last few jackdaws. Um, 
one of the other things I've, I've hoping to come up with, and I'm going to really take my time to do this very, very well, is I'm going to do a book. And it is going to be a reference book. And it's going to be everything to do with vintage paperbacks. So I'm going to try and get experts on a particular publisher to write about that publisher. I'm going to write, I'm going to have sections yeah. on collectors and people who've been like paperback dealers. I'm going to go around and interview all the key sort of players in the hobby, publishers, people who were around you know, doing this in the 70s, 80s, 90s, whilst they're still around with us. Uh, it's going to be profusely in illustrated. And it's going to be an absolute collector's dream. That is that is what I'm planning. So it's going to be everything you could possibly imagine to do with vintage paperback collecting. And not just the early stuff that I like. Um, you know, it's going to be bang up to date. It's going to cover all the you know, modern stuff like movie tying collecting and horror, recent horror collecting, right up to uh, modern stuff being released, you know, like the, uh, the stuff like Hard Case Crime, for example. So that is a plan. And um, it's not something I'm going to rush into, but it's going to take some time. And it's going to be, I hope, the absolute ultimate sort of book on the subject. Um, I don't really think it's, I want to do anything approaching a price guide because pricing of these sorts of things is relative. It changes all the time. It's more going to be sort of an appreciation of collecting the books for what they are, focusing on great collections of the books or, you know, people who collect a certain author and things like this or a genre. And then, um, put them all together into one hopefully really entertaining book. So that's the sort of thing, that idea is something that I've been toying around for a few months in my head as the next project to, to set my mind to. Obviously, I'll keep the YouTube channel going, but set my mind to whilst now that the studio is, is pretty much been built and paid for. So something like that to get it as lavish as I'm looking to do it um, is going to take quite a bit of finance and to be honest um, it's very very unlikely that a publisher is going to want to come to me and say Jules that sounds perfect you know let me give you an advance so that you can go off and do all this stuff so I am intending to pay the authors who contribute to the book um, so certain authors, for example, if, if it's an authority on a particular subject um, and they're willing to put together, you know, something which is you know, really substantial on it, then absolutely I should be paying people to do that. But I think the actual book itself, to do it how I want to do it, I don't think a publisher would really, um, it wouldn't really be cost effective. Um, but I think I'm going to be doing it as a sort of like a Kickstarter, give myself plenty of time. And, uh, but I am going to wait until I've got, before I launch it, before I've got quite a bit of it already in the bag. And then it will just be the last few bits to improve it. And there's going to be everything, you know, as I said, books on, it'll be sections on publishers, sections on, you know, the more collectible authors will look at different genres, will look at cover artists, and then we'll look at collections. And I don't just mean like, you know, photos that people have sent me. I want the photos to be sort of really, really professional uh, to get included. So it's not going to be something that's just going to be really, really easy to put together. Um, but I know a lot of collectors through this channel, I've got to know even more. And um, every single person I've spoken to about it has been super keen to get involved because it is, it is going to be the absolute almanac, the who's who of collecting vintage paperbacks. And that's what I want it to be. So if you're interested in my new book, 
on vintage paperbacks, which hasn't even got a title yet, that I'm putting together. And you'd like, if you class yourself as an expert on a particular publisher or genre, um, then I am very much looking to speak to you. Um, for more collectible authors, I think it warrants them having their own um, their own section. So someone like, I don't know, if I could find someone who was a really good Agatha Christie expert to write on collecting her in paperback, for example, uh, Philip K. Dick, another really collectible author, J.G. Ballard, you know, all, all sort of the, the people who had, uh, you know, Edgar Rice Burroughs, um, those sorts of things, they have to have their own section within the book, um, just because they're so, you know, they're such a big part of literature and paperback publishing in general. So they have to be included, but you know, something like Edgar Rice Burroughs, um, I don't have the knowledge to write that, but there are people out there who do. So that is what we're sort of looking at putting together. So if you'd like to get involved, And as I said, this is a paid opportunity. So I am intending to pay people for completed articles on a particular subject. Um, and now is your chance to get in touch. So if you're an expert on a particular subject, like I would say, Nicholas Royal is an expert on collecting picadors. And I'd be more than happy to include a section on that because it's something that people collect. And I just want, every single genre, publisher, author, as much as possible um, to be included. Now, there's no way I could include every author, but there are certainly a, a massive batch of authors who are far more collectible than others. Um, and then there's that series collectors. So someone like my friend Chris in the States, who collects Star Trek books, for example. I couldn't think of a better person to pen a piece about collecting the Star Trek books, but if he doesn't fancy it, or if he's never done it before, I'm sure be able to, we could feature his collection rather than his history of collecting the books, you know? So there's lots of ways. You don't have to contribute with an article. You could always say, well, look, I've got this great collection. I'd love it to be featured. And I could just interview you about your collection and feature it that way, you know? Um, I think one of the most fascinating things about being a book collector is then looking at other people's bookshelves. Um, particularly if, if it's like archival almost in nature and you've got stuff which is, you know, of interest to other people. Now, it would be lovely if I had the budget to just fly around the world and film everyone's collections. Well, that ain't going to happen. So the next best thing would be photos and that. So, uh, People who featured their collections in my collector's videos are obvious candidates. But I have to draw the line, so it has to be, I can't go into the realm of first hardback editions or, you know, modern firsts or anything like that. It has to be paperbacks. You know, the, the collecting James Bond in paperback alone would probably be a whole massive chapter to be honest for the people collecting the British and American editions. Um, I've got one more jackdaw and then that's all the jackdaws and they're really colourful aren't they? Uh, jackdaw number two look at that maybe it's a first I'm not sure I'm just sort of repairing these as I go but let me know your first initial thoughts about a book looking at the all-encompassing world of collecting vintage paperbacks and all the different sorts of things that you can collect. It will feature books, you know, features, it will feature articles on repairing books and tracking books down, tips to collecting, where to look for if it's a certain thing. And if it's broken down into like publisher, for example, you know, if there's specialist websites, they'll be linked to in the books. It's never going to remain completely up to date, but I think it's been so long since something like that's come out. And I think it would make an absolutely gorgeous sort of, well, it's, I want it to be the ultimate collector's 
almanac for vintage paperbacks. That's sort of what I'm aiming at. So if that tickles your fancy, give me a shout. And uh, I have already started um, doing the first steps by speaking to a few people who I absolutely want to be involved. And uh, everyone has said yes. So that's good news, isn't it? Right, we'll move on to some guild books now. These are in varying conditions. Um, these are regular guild books. They weren't guild services editions, which I do find um, slightly more interesting. Um, these sort of varying condition. And what, what, what guild books were, were a guild of publishers. So publishers who had hardback lists, um, who didn't have their own dedicated paperback list, but they were looking at people like Penguin and Pan and Collins with envious eyes and Hutchinson and thinking, oh, we need a paperback list. Oh, we haven't got one. So they, uh, they bandied together and created guild books. And that's what these are. So they're from various publishers who had hardback books and they were just looking at a little bit of the, uh, the paperback market. I do have a reasonable uh, collection of guild books because I got some in that when I bought that mega collection a couple of years ago with all those pans in, there was a fair run of guild books in there. Um, but I honestly, I don't think there's going to be that many doubles because I haven't got that many. But I've got some, you know. So I'll just have to see. But some might be upgrades to what I've got. Others, maybe not. But like all my... Uh, like all my doubles, I just list them up on uh, on my eBay. So I always have a link in my descriptions down below to my eBay auctions. And admittedly, my listings are a bit depleted at the moment because I've just not really had a chance to list much new stuff. But um, I did just sell a, a batch of a uh, hundred or so vintage pan books to a collector in Europe, um, and. I do still have a lot of pan books up for grabs, probably about 400. So um, they're all in order and they're predominantly number only early giants and a few early um, great pans. So if there's anything in particular you're after, um, drop me a line and I'll see what I can come up with. Um, but my collector in Europe was very, very happy. in a particularly awkward place. So I'm just, these are, this is the tail end of the books we're going to be looking at today. And then I'm going to need to go through and, um, and give them a clean. So look at this. So the, ju the jury, Gerald Bullet, and look, there's a picture of him there. That must have, where's that come from, I wonder? So this has got some writing inside. J.S. was reading this at the time she went. I had got to page 59 using the patterned papers as book something. She liked it very much. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> Translation, please. J.S. was reading this at the time she went. I had got to page 59 using the patterned papers as, as a bookmark. She liked it very much. Go as far as page 59. Oh, look, look at page 59. Look at you, can you believe it? So I say to you there, Nicholas Royal, that's an inclusion and a half, isn't it? Don't you agree? <laughs> I'm going to stick those back into page 59 simply because it just, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> oh, I love finding stuff like that. So this is a bit of a beaten old copy. Oh, dust wrapper remnants, you could call this. It's lit, look at it, it's literally falling to bits in it, so not to worry. Let's see the book underneath here. The 
Yeah, a bit of a tired old copy this one. 1941 though, it's quite, a, quite an early one. Now I don't think there's much I can do with the wrapper here, it's just... Uh, it's as flat as it can be. This is once again, this is probably the one I'll, I'll take it off and put in my box of wrappers when it goes into the collection because as it stands like that on the shelf, that's absolutely fine. But if I was to put this tatty old wrapper with it, it's gonna get really, uh, really hammered. So I'm gonna put it back on to keep it together for now. But when it gets shelved, I think I'm gonna just take it off because it makes the book quite, quite a mess and it doesn't look quite as lovely on the shelf. There we are. Well, it's used all my powers of uh, repairing today with these books. This, this feels like a wartime one with the, uh, the style of paper that's been used. The quality of paper. Yeah, 1936 I spotted, so yeah. A few more thinnies. Quite a fragile one, this. Boy, oh boy, they've made a bit of a mess, haven't they, today, the books. But I sort of expected it. But we also got lucky timing-wise with those Penguin books from Drew and the, star, the first of those two Star Trek loads. Now, this one needs a bit of gentle repair on the spine because it really is quite rough. But we have only got a few more books to go through. Then we're going to zoom through and give them all a dust off. And then the Star Trek ones, we're going to give a polish to. And the, and the 60s uh, penguins, they can all have a polish. But these other ones, stuff like this, we can't polish them. We just, all we can do is give them a, give them a dusting. Because if we were to put any polish on them, they would... It'd be like pouring water on them, so. Quite a fiddly little operation is for such a thin little book as well. I just want one more slither in, in there. Lovely. Well, as lovely as it can be, just put it that way. Look at this, it's come off. Oh, so what's happened here is that the glue has just aged. Like us all, it's got old. So I'm going to rub off that little bit of old glue there. There's the cover. That's got a 15p on the front. We'll get rid of that now as well. And then I've just seen on this one, there was a big three on the front of there, which I completely missed. It missed quality control, Governor. There we are. 
Right, so we just look at the actual book itself before we glue it back in. It's okay. But for some reason, yeah, the glue is just completely aged and um, it's come away from the cover. So it's much, because this is, this is how the old books were bound. If I was to run my glue stick along that, I'm not going to get much of a purchase. So I'm going to run it along there and the, the spine. And the two things should go together quite, quite nicely then. There we are. So that's the spine quite nicely done. And then I'm going to just, I am going to do this, but I put the, the blue tack right up high so it just sort of falls in. There we are. That should be fine. Make sure we get it on the right way for the bending sickle. There we are. There we are. So quite a simple repair in actual fact, even though the entire cover was off. That sometimes makes it easier. There we are. So we've got two more guilds. <laughs> Amazingly, we've got more albatross. We've got a 20p on there. And as I sort of expected, this is ending up to be quite a long video, but I reckon I should be able to get it all in for under an hour and a half with a bit of luck. But I'm sure you don't mind. No one's ever said to me, your videos are too long. <laughs> Believe it or not. Fort in the jungle. PC Wren. So this one sadly is coming away. I can't pull the rest of the cover away, so I'm just gonna get some glue in there just to do it, because apart from that, it's actually a really nice copy and a nice wrapper as well. So I'm just gonna put some generous, generous blobs of the blue tack in there. Keep it all into one piece. Right. So even though that's in, there's a tiny bit at the top which is still poking out, which is quite annoying. So I'm just gonna have to stick that in there, like that. quite nicely that one and it is in a wrapper there's nine pence this book there we are and then the last thing we've got to look at today 
we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven albatrosses. So we already had an albatross earlier, didn't we? It was uh, an, an Ageo marsh. So uh, this is a few more. That's in nice condition. Previous owner's name. I think this year alone, I must have doubled my collection of albatross books. I'm really amazed by how many I've now got. Um, and it might even be worth once um, I've definitely got the last from this uh, older couple. I think it's probably time to dig all my albatrosses out and have another reevaluation of the series, you know. English saga. Oh, lovely that. Oh, I just love them. Little albatross from Paris. Little, uh, put me on your mailing list to get their catalogue. I've still yet to see an albatross catalogue. I'd love to. I don't know if anyone's got one. Unlike the penguin ones, which seem really plentiful, you can, you can get most of the penguin ones without too much trouble. But the albatross one, I've just never seen it. Never even seen it. But I would love to. Well, I've got to say, it's proved to be quite a month, hasn't it, January? Very, very lucky to get so many books in one month. Another Aldous Huxley, Unders Uncle Spencer, and other stories. Oh, what's this? Someone's pasted this in, a Nicholas Bentley impression of Mr. Aldous Huxley. Oh. How dare they sully the book? <laughs> we'll let them off because it is related to it, I suppose. So we'll give them a, we'll let them off this time. We'll give them a pass. Looks to be in fountain pen. Oh no, it was actually in thick pencil. I need the old Hoover out. Once I've uh, finished cleaning this lot, blimey O'Reilly. I did, uh, had all my vintage Fontanas out before I filmed this, this morning, and uh, it was an absolute delight going through those again. Oh, look at another one. This is a white one this time. They, they tended to be color coded depending on the book. Really, really nice. Um, but yeah, I had all my, uh, Fontana's out there, just superb, with the lovely Tom Adams covers. Fantastic. Now this one I've actually got, but look, it's um, it was orange, but it's got a faded spine. But this one actually is a double. I've actually got this one, so this will be heading to eBay at some point. Lion Dinger. Albatross number two. I wonder if it gives the uh, copyright 1932. Might even be an early one. Might be the first, for example. Which is good to have an early one in a first edition. A couple more here. 
Mother's Cry, Helen Grace Carlyle. Little 60p inside that one. A lot of these have had little prices in, haven't they? And the last one, Cossack Girl. <laughs> She is. Right, so that's all the books sort of given a first once over. Now, the really, all of them are going to need the top edges brushed off with my brush. So that's going to be the next step. And then the ones which need a polish as well, that's going to be the, the final step. And that's really mainly the penguins and the, uh, the Star Trek books. So I'm going to sort those out first of all. And then we'll be back. So let's make a bit of room here. Right then, so I'm just going to grab some wedges of books. And these ones here are all ones which um, I'm not going to be polishing. So uh, just the edges here are going to need. Brushing down. really aren't too bad to be honest but we have got a few slightly older books which are looking the worst for wear later on haven't we it's funny just looking at that one it's a tiny little bit that needs re-gluing so that one Sadly, did miss quality control, but it will only take just a tiny bit of tiny bit of glue. Just the bottom of the spine here. There we are. So these ones here with their they're like matte covers. They, these cannot be polished in any way because it won't do them any good at all. That one's really interesting. That yeah, I'm gonna have a look through that one. That, that does look quite an interesting read. Dust on that one. Look at that. Plumes of it coming off. You can almost see it visibly getting lighter in front of your eyes, can't you? That has come from a very, very dusty place indeed. It's come up all right, hasn't it? A little bit of toning, but it's in you know immaculate condition. You can imagine that was on the, the shelf in some publisher somewhere, you know. At least I imagine it was. Oh, there we go. Put 
all the way over there because we can't do any more to those today. Um, next, this pile at the back here. These are from the same sort of ilk, as in we can't polish them, but we can give them a darn good brushing. And I'm grouping these into um, uh, sort of size order so that they're easier to clean up. There's another one at the bottom there with a tiny, needs the tiniest, tiniest bit of glue. Didn't pick that one up first time round. So I took a break over lunch after we'd sorted the initial batch out and I uh, went into the studio and I built the table. Hurrah! And I did a little bit more of the uh, backdrop, which is coming together very nicely. It is still missing a few sort of props, as I would say, something interesting to put behind me, some figures and things like that. Um, but I have to say it's starting to come together really, really well. So after today, or rather tomorrow, because I've got another day off tomorrow, um, I'll uh, move everything up to the studio and have a little play around experimenting with the sound and what have you. And then I've got a couple of days off next week where I'll uh, start filming my first videos in there properly. Uh, in the meantime, I because I try and do something on it every single day, even if there's only something small before or after work like I do with my channel all the time. Try and do something each day with it. There we are. <sighs> so that top one's, it's lightened a bit. It's not perhaps as much as I would like, but it's just the sheer age of it. And it's not been particularly well looked after. It's a bit of a, it's in a bit of a rough old state, sadly. Once again, I've never really done a video on my, these really early Guild books and Hutchinson's and my other sort of non, you know, British publishers, but sort of wartime ones. I don't really know what the demand is for that because lots of people like my more recent sort of 70s stuff. These are really getting into the realms of antiques. I mean, they're not quite antiques yet, but they're 80 to 90 years old, a lot of these books. And, um, you know, the, the amount of people actually collecting them is probably quite slim, although I imagine quite a few people would pick them up if they came across them. Not so with the penguins, of course, because they are widely collected to this day. Lots of people like penguins. And these ones I got from Drew here, I can't imagine they're going to need much in the way of cleaning because they all look very clean and presentable anyway. But these ones here are going to be ones that um, are going to be those ones over there. I can actually afford to put a bit of polish on those. Mm. 
wonder if you can see the plumes of smoke coming off there. Plumes of dust that looks like smoke, I should say. And I found I get a much better clean using this shoe brush than using an old toothbrush. Although the toothbrush is handy for accuracy. And I've been using it recently on cleaning my vintage Star Wars figures to great effect. You know, just getting inside the like, nooks and crannies and that really has made quite a difference. delicate little Egyptian one in the middle so I'm going to uh, sandwich that between the two of them so I can give it as good a brush down as I can. Yes, lightened it a little bit as I expected it would but because of its age and history, it's no surprise at all that that is going to be as it's going to be. So I'm just going to pop that up there because obviously I can't put any polish on that one. And that was actually the same for a couple of these other earlier ones, which I've got uh, matte covers, so I can't pop that one through the polishing process. And um, that one either. The rest of them should be absolutely fine to give a little polish to in a minute. Now we've got those Star Trek books. Now these should benefit greatly from having a good dust off. Um, and then the ultimate thing bringing these back to life will be when we, uh, when we polish them. particularly going on there where the, this collection is noted for having some sort of mottling and a bit, the tiniest, tiniest bit of damp got in there. But once these are polished, these colours, this black that's just going to jump back up, they'll sort of like come back to life. It'll be incredible, I, I assure you. <laughs> we know they're all okay inside. And this will be all the edges done as good as we can get them. So it really will just be the, uh, the polish will really finish these off. If you have a look, there's a really close look at them before we give it the dust off. And that's after, it's definitely fainter. It's not perfect, but the time they've been cleaned and dusted this surface if you can see it on there that's like surface storage wear that's just going to lift right off with some polish so we're not going to see any of that at all that's going to just all come off and the books will be left looking really quite nice indeed 
But as I said, to complete my next gen collection, I'm gonna need probably to buy a few little job lots. And uh, there's bound to be upgrades and things like that coming my way. So I'm not overly worried if I've got fewer low grade copies just for the time being, because none of them thankfully are that rare, to my knowledge anyway. Right, so that pile there, the penguins and the Star Treks, that's all good to be polished. And then we've just got our last load here of books that don't need a polish, or that can't be polished rather. So we'll split these into small wedges. few dirty ones here, as you can see. Nice, made quite a difference to those actually. Last few of the non polishing ones. Horrifically dirty, these. <laughs> Let's improve them a bit, <laughs> but they were tough. Right, that's all the polishing done, so that's good news. So, last step. Let's see, I'm not going to polish that one. Last step is to. Uh, Get me old Mr. Sheen out. Oh, now he is rather low, but I do have another bottle in reserve. Phew. So I think we'll do the Star Treks first because they are gonna need the most work. And you can afford with these really shiny covers to be a little bit more liberal. So look at it beforehand. See all this mottling on the spine on the back? See that there on the back? Once this has been given the, the once over, it should come out really, really nicely. So I've been quite generous with the spray. Right, coming up nice and bright. It's exactly, exactly what I was hoping for.
at that. It's come up virtually brand new. All that mold and storage wear has come off. The only thing that's going to be left is that. Look at that. How cool is that? And they'll all be similar sort of process. All of these there, they've sort of got the storage wear in the same place, sort of just by the spine. And you can sort of feel it as you work your way along the cover. You can sort of feel where there's dirt and where you're cleaning it off. It's an extremely satisfying feeling. There we are. So that's the second one, but look, two books, quite a lot of, now it's interesting that that's actually sort of yellowy. That usually denotes it's been in the collection of a smoker, but I don't believe, there's no smell of tobacco or anything. So I don't think that that's the case with these. It's just um, interesting. Um, yeah, this is, this is one which has been read quite a few times by the look of it, or at least a couple, because um, it's, it's the worst one of the whole batch. So it's definitely going to be one that I would consider as a filler for now. But it's still okay. It's better than not having it at all. And um, before I film the videos, I like to um, read as many as I can get in. So I'm trying to do a Trek video once every, every other month, basically, because they take a lot of researching. As I said, I try and read the books if I can, if it's ones that I've not read before, just so I can give my own sort of take on it. And also, I like to research the history of what was going on at that time. Um, so I think by introducing the next generation, because I'm covering the books chronologically, it's definitely going to add another dimension to it. So this is another one that was really bad. So much that it's actually got spots, spots on the front cover. So I'm just going to put one squirt straight on there. And still using the bit of duster which has got, um, which is already slightly wet, damp with the books that have gone before. Because this one actually was had so much wear, it was really quite, quite noticeable. It's actually easier to see on the back there. So you see on the back there, just all that mottling is really dry and crusty. I put my uh, duster on and it literally just disappears. Really, really simple and easy and cheap way to look after your books and keep them nice and fresh. Look at that. Gorgeous, isn't it? Uh, there we are. Oh, it's another one which is in a, a sorry old state, but it cleans up so well, it's brilliant. Yeah, so I knew when I saw this lot that I could, I could sort of see beyond the initial muck, if you know what I mean. And uh, it really, it really worked. And when I had the shop, um, this is what we used to do with new stock as it came in. And we'd give everything the once over with some polish and that just to tidy it up before we put it out on for sale. Um, something that doesn't really happen in secondhand shops these days or anything. But in fact, I was recently at a fair in Exeter, a, like a comic con. And uh, I was amazed at how badly presented a lot of it was. That's just down to the individual dealers. They weren't, you know, I'm not saying they're professional or anything. I'm just saying, I didn't think, you know, they were, you know, when they're looking to charge. Yeah, I remember there was a video game store and it was like, I forget their name now. They had some lovely stuff, really nice games in that and some rare stuff. But, and they were charging a 10 to 20 pound for some of those games, but they were so badly presented just in some cardboard boxes. It made them look cheap and you didn't feel like spending any money. If that at all makes sense. So 
So, not many to go now. But I am very, very pleased with the, uh, the way that they're coming up, which is lovely. Yes, over in the UK, when the next generation came along, apart from Encounter at Farpoint, which we did have the American Pocket edition of, after that they were published by over here by Titan Books, and they used the same jacket artwork and that, but they just um, they were locally printed and they just didn't have the same sort of feel for me as the Pocket Books, and of course eventually they just knocked it on the head and um, Simon and Schuster distributed the Pocket Books directly into shops and. Uh, in my in my shop purple haze we we stopped the whole range everything that was in print basically i just wish i'd saved a bit more than i did <laughs> Last Trek book. So imagine if the person who was selling these had bothered to clean them all and had put in the list in all first editions. I think she probably would have been able to get quite a bit more money. Look at that. Probably would have been able to get quite a bit more for her cash, for her books. Right, so let's whack these up over here. And then we've got our last little lot of penguins recently acquired from the penguin chap. And such will end today's fairly epic video. But it's been very satisfying, so it's all good. And these won't need anything like the Trek books, just a cursory once over. But it will make a difference before they go into the collection. Of cases it's almost like uh, invisible dirt and grime fingerprints and that that's amassed over the last five to six decades with these books here you know but these on the whole were so nice they've probably only been read a couple of times so generally speaking they're in nice nick anyway Yeah, so as we come to a close then, I do hope you've enjoyed this month's pickup. So there's some cool stuff in here. There's some great cleaning action. You're up to date with the channel. So next time, literally from tomorrow, I'm going to be filming in the studio. So that's super cool. Once again, give some thought if you've watched it this far. If you're a specialist in a particular area, I'm going to be banging on about this for a while now. Um, but rest assured, it's the next, basically it's the next project after the studio is finally completed and it's almost there, so. I think it'll be quite a good thing to do. We'll probably launch it on some Kickstarter or something like that. Unless of course, there is the vague chance that there's a publisher or someone who knows a publisher and uh, they might be willing to fund such a 
an epic an epic undertaking if so you know how to get in touch with me julesbrow at gmail.com and we'll uh we shall talk but it would be lovely to get it published by a mainstream publisher but i just don't think it's going to happen i have got a professional book designer who's going to do it for me he's a friend of mine and he designs books for a living which is quite handy isn't it and he's one of my best mates so he's going to do it bit by bit and create an overall look and theme and um, as soon as we've got the first few articles in i shall get them laid out and share them with you because i think it's going to be super cool at least that is the plan but it's not something that's going to happen quickly that much i know I do hope you've enjoyed this slightly longer than usual monthly pickups video and vlog because they are sort of what's happening in the channel videos as well aren't they if you have don't forget to give it that thumbs up it does make a difference anything you want to say leave me a comment stuff you'd like to see on the channel in the future I'm always open to ideas don't forget, we've got Patreon and channel memberships available if you want to support the channel and my efforts from as little as a pound or a dollar a month, which is not a lot. Um, it really does make a difference, particularly when, you know, YouTube is not paying out that much to YouTubers these days because, of you know, advertisers are tightening their belts and it is advertising led. So channels such as mine, which are fairly niche, let's be honest, um, do rely on uh, direct support that way quite a bit to keep the wheels turning as it were so if you can spare a pound a month that would be very very gratefully received and uh, it would go closer to uh, my dream of doing this at least part-time as a living <laughs> which is not there yet sadly but you know you never know but yeah, thank you very, very much for watching today. And I shall look forward to seeing you again in four to five weeks time with my February pickups, which at the moment is looking like a, some more Star Trek books as we speak. <laughs> Bye.